Move, are you guys good? Man, we're here, baby. We're here. I don't know what your last year and a half of your life have been like. Mine has been a game changer. Like my life has literally changed in the last year and a half, right? I remember when it started, right? Early 2020. Some people said it was around before then, but I, if it was, I wasn't aware of it, right? Early 2020 is the first time I became aware of it. And, you know, and, and no one knew exactly where it came from. People thought it was from China, and we've talked about that for a while. And, and I'll never forget, like, I told myself at the beginning, this is what I told myself, I'm like, I'm not getting it. I'm not. I am not getting it. And then over the course of the year, more people started to get it. Like people I knew started to get it. And I'm like, oh, well, if these people are getting it, I don't, well, I don't know. And then, and then the thing was like, but, but like little kids can't get it. That was the thing, right? Like if you're under 12, you can't get it. That was like, we talked about that for a while, right? But my daughter's school, my, her middle school, it's like they all got it. And, I, and, and so I was like, you know what? That's it, I'm going in, I'm jumping in. And so I did it. I downloaded TikTok. <laughs> what did you think I was talking about? <laughs> no, TikTok, TikTok's a trip, man. Like that, that thing's a trip, okay? I download this thing, it's like, it's like the Wild West, right? Like I'm ordering stuff off Amazon I don't need anymore. I'm learning dances, ooh, to be gone. <laughs> What, what is this? That's not a dance move. This is what you do after you eat B-dubs and you gotta go to the bathroom. You're just like, ah. TikTok's a trip, man. I did, uh, I, you know, early 2020, I had a lot of free time on my hand. I was sheltering in place. And so I'm like, I wanna see what this TikTok thing's about. First thing's this, okay? When you first get on TikTok, it's the wild west, man. It's the wild west. I, I learned things as a 40-year-old man when I got on TikTok. Things I didn't even know. Phrases I didn't even know. She, I don't know. You know, I didn't know. I'll never forget. I got on TikTok, and, uh, and, and here's the thing. Until TikTok learns your algorithm, until it learns like, what you're interested in, it just kind of throws everything at you. Now you go to my FYP and now it's like, it's all like, you know, cooking shows, it's dog tricks, it's like, you know, kids getting, you know, falling out of trees. Like, it's just stuff that I'm like, you know, like, like to watch. But when you first get on TikTok, be careful, be careful. Because it was early on in TikTok, I learned a phrase that I didn't fully understand. The phrase was this, oh, she's thirsty. Now, I am a child of the 1980s, okay? I was born in the late 9th, the 20th century, okay? I was born in a completely different century. And so for me, when I was growing up, thirst, when it came down like to thirst, when you talk about someone being thirsty, like when, when you said someone's thirsty to me as a young child your age, I would have thought of this guy, right? I would have thought of Michael Jordan. Would you check out... That is a glass Gatorade bottle, people. Gatorade used to come in glass bottles. 1991, 1991, Michael Jordan was the first athlete to be endorsed by Gatorade. 1991, he was the, first, the greatest basketball player of all time. Sit down, LeBron. Sit down, LeBron. The real GOAT in 1991 was endorsed by Gatorade. He took, his endorsement took that company from a $500 million company to over a billion dollar in revenue. People saw Michael Jordan with the, the Gatorade towel on his back, slamming the, the cups, you know, throwing it away, game seven, boom. Just like he, they saw everything happening. And so what you, when I saw thought of Thirsty, that's what I thought of, Michael Jordan. Now when TikTok said Thirsty, whoo, they meant something different. And, and here's what got me thinking. New things are new because they're cool, right? TikTok's kind of cool or whatever, and new things are new because they're cool. But classic things never go out of style. 
because they're truly impactful. And so that got me thinking about this phrase. What does it actually mean to be thirsty? And, and what does it actually look like to be thirsty? And how do you and I actually interact with this word thirsty? I mean, is it the, the way culture does it today? Is it this new kind of thing, like, a, like you know, the trapping people or whatever? Is that what we're talking about? Or is it like talking about this desire to have a deep internal need, a carnal need met to have your thirst quenched? Here's what I want to do with my time. What I want to do with my time is I want to just go through the Bible. I want to show you something that is so classic that it has lasted centuries. I want to show you something. I mean, not all social media is last, right? I mean, RIP MySpace, right? We will always remember you, Tom. Okay. But what's interesting is this. The Bible has never been out of out of mind. The Bible has never been out of society. The Bible has never been, you know, non-relevant. Like what happens is in the Bible still happens to this day. And what's interesting is even when I first got on TikTok and I'm learning all this stuff about TikTok and I'm watching all these people on TikTok, what I'm seeing on TikTok is exactly what I saw when I read scripture. And I'm going to show it to you. And I want you to see it too. Because I feel like a lot of us, what we want, what we want is actually right here. But maybe we just don't know how to unpack it or how to grasp onto it. And so that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. That's what we're looking at tonight. So if you have a Bible with you or a Bible app, could you get that out for me? Could you get your Bible out into that same chapter that you just read during worship? That's where we're going to be. We're going to be in John chapter 4. And then while you're turning to John chapter 4, what you're going to see is we're going to be talking about this woman at the well. And it's a passage that, that we read just a minute ago, but I just wanted to slow it down. And here, kind of say this, when you read your Bible, could you do this for me? Slow down. I think so many times people, they feel this pressure, like I have to have a quiet time or I have to do a Bible study and I have to, you know, get through a Bible in a year. And they, they turn reading the Bible into this, this, this race that you're trying to get this book done as fast as possible. Do you realize this text is not supposed to be finished? It is supposed to be fulfilled in the way that you live. This is not just information to breeze through. These are words of life that will actually empower you, prepare you, embolden you to face anything this world throws at you. This is not a trend. This is a sacred, holy tradition that has lasted the, the expanse of time because these words aren't just popular words. These words are the words of life. And these words, I'm even going to go so far as to say this, these words are the words that humanity wants. Not just Christians, all people. All people want this to be true. And so I want to unpack it with you and walk through it with you. If you have your Bible open, John chapter 4 is where we're going to be. We're going to pick it up in verse 4. And, and what we see here right off the bat is this phrase that Jesus is going, is going to say about Jesus says this. Now he, talking about Jesus, says this. Now he had to go through Samaria. Stop right there. He had to go through Samaria. Now, I don't know, you know, if that's, that's John's opinion. I don't know what, what John was thinking about, but here's what I know is absolutely true, okay? Oh, he lying. He lying. So if you go to the Bible, what you see um, is in the back of the Bible, there's this little section called maps, right? And you go to the maps, you, you see that the region that Jesus is in is this region called, you know, kind of Israel. And there's this northern section and a southern section. Every year, every Jew had to go to the southern section, you know, to Judea, to where Jerusalem is, for the Passover meal, for the celebration. After that meal, they would go back north up to the Sea of Galilee where many of them lived. Now, here's what's true, is you do not have to go through Samaria. You don't have to. In fact, most Jews did not. In fact, we'll put a map here on the screen. You can see, you know, Judea is at that, that kind of, you know, 
tan kind of color right there at the bottom there. And what they would do is they would not go straight north to the teal kind of blue Samaria. They would never do that. No Jew would do that at the time. What they would actually do is right where Bethany is, right around in there, they would cross the Jordan River into what is modern day Jordan. And then they would go north on the other side of the river. And then when they got up to the, to the north by Nain or so, then they would cut back over to their side. Almost no Jew wanted to walk through Samaria, but yet here it says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. The only way that sentence could be true is if it's not talking about geography. Because geographically speaking, he does not have to. But our Lord absolutely had to go through Samaria. Here's why that matters. It matters because of who the Samaritan people are. The Samaritan people were a people that were originally Jewish. They were Hebrew, just like all the other Jews. But what had happened is that northern kingdom, that kingdom where Samaria is, was completely dominated by other kingdoms, Assyrians and these other people who came through. And when they dominated this, this area, they, they, enter, they, they married the people there and, and, and they had babies with the people there. And so the people of Samaria, they're no longer racially Jews. They're now part Jew, part Assyrian, part Jew, part something else. We see, uh, you know, most likely uh, Timothy kind of comes from this region. We see this, this, this confluence of different, you know, uh, honestly, races mixing together and to the Jewish people many of them weren't comfortable with that many of them didn't want to go through Samaria because they didn't want to be around Samaritans in our culture to, today you know, the word Samaritan is, is always personified with good right the good Samaritan or good Samaritan hospital or, or we talk about these type of things but in that culture to the Jewish people Samaritan lives did not matter they did not want to be around them. Oh, and the feeling was mutual. Samaritans didn't need the Jews. And then Rome didn't care about any of them. And so what you see is right off the bat, the Gospel of John tells us, hey, you know, you know what's going on in your world right now? It's been going on since the beginning of time. I joke about, you know, TikTok and whatever, but this last year and a half has been hard. I watch the same TV you watch. I watch the same YouTube videos you watch. I've seen the unrest. I've seen the lack of dignity. I've seen hate being spewed from one race to another and then back and forth, everybody being guilty. I've seen this same exact unrest. And, and here's the thing, I'm, I'm a little bit older than most of you are. I've, I've been on this, this ride a little bit longer. And some of you may be thinking, like, is this it? Or is this falling apart? Or is this, is this the way it all ends? Or well, I don't know, maybe you're afraid because it seems like racism is out of control. In our church, that's what our students want to talk about. How do we fight racism? How we stand up against racism? How we put it into racism? Understand this, there has always been racism because racism is a result of sin and there's always been sinners. And even centuries before, this was still an issue. Just because we see it on social media blasted out into our eyes, it doesn't mean that it has not always been the case. Racism has always been around us. But Jesus says, I have to go to that area. I have to go to where those people are. I have to show by example that there's a different way. All that in one sentence, he had to go through Samaria. And then it goes on and it says this, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground where Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, 
tired, uh, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. Jesus had to go to Samaria. And he sits down by the well. But notice why he sits down by the well. Jesus isn't thirsty. He's tired. First, I love that just like that Jesus has humanity, that Jesus has human characters, that he does get tired, that every now and then he's like, you know, we've been walking for a few hours, let's take a break. I love that. But I love just that little detail, that the reason Jesus chose this location wasn't because he wanted water. I think it's because he knew who was about to wander into the scene. So he sits down by this well at noon. And that time is important. Maybe some of you have heard pastors preach this, this passage before. Maybe you know that, that the noon sun, the hot day sun, this is the, the time when, when no one would want to go outside, when no one would want to be doing chores. No one would definitely want to be doing heavy lifting at that time. In fact, it was a very common practice to go early in the morning to get all the water you would need for that day for your household. So that way you got it while it was still cool, you got it back home, and then you used it in your home during that day. But at noon... This woman comes to the well, most likely wanting to avoid other people, most likely not wanting to have conversations with anyone. And then she walks up and Jesus is there. In verse seven, it goes on, it says this, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Now, this was a game changer. Because not only was race a huge issue in this region and a huge issue between the Jews and the Samaritans, but then also, especially in Hebrew culture, there was a divide in gender as well. Could you imagine living in a day and age where men villainized women and women villainized men and there was a divide in gender and people couldn't talk to one another or get along with one another. I think sometimes we act like 2021 is this unique kind of firestorm we're finding ourselves in. But what Jesus tells us is people have always been people and people will always find reasons And so here's this woman, and Jesus says, can you give me a drink? And and, and look what she says. It goes on, verse 9. The woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I'm not just a Samaritan. You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For the Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And that's what seemed natural. What seemed natural was for men not to talk to women out in public because that's just not what people did. What seemed natural was for Jews not to talk with Samaritans because that's what the majority of people did. It seemed natural because when people looked to their left and their right, when they were scrolling through with everybody around them, what they saw was everybody highlighting these things. The divide in race, the divide in gender, the divide in these things. And and what you see is she is perplexed. Because Jesus is not doing what everyone else does. He's a Jew and she's a Samaritan. He's a man, she's a woman, and he's talking to her. And he asks for water. But remember, he wasn't thirsty. He did not stop because he was thirsty. So he asks her for water. And she says, no, I... I'm a, it's not for you to ask me that. In verse 10, it goes on, it says, Jesus answered her, and this is what I love, Jesus tells her this, then, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. If I had my Bible open, I would put a line next to that, I would underline that, because that is the words of your Lord, that is the words of your Savior, that is the words of the heart of God that he wants to give you living water still today. But look what she says. Verse 11, she says what we say, the exact same thing that we say. Look what she says. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing 
to draw, the wa- draw with, and the well is deep. Where are you going to get living water? Where are you going to get living water? I still hear that same question today. It's phrased a little bit different. To this woman, she's looking at a very practical problem. And then she sees Jesus and she says, you don't look like you have the practical answer. You want water, you don't even have a bucket. How are you going to do anything about water? And Jesus is like, you don't even get it. But that's still the same conversation that we have in the church today. I can't tell you how many times people in the church today, when they see, you know, uh, what is happening in our world, they're seeing these divides, they're seeing these issues, and they're saying, why, was it, why won't Jesus fix that? He doesn't, you know, what, the way that Jesus wants to fix that won't work. I've, I've had people in my church come up to me, what are we going to do about bad people? I said, well, we're, we're going to love them. We're going to love our enemies. That won't work. They'll get away with it. If we love them, then, then they'll think it's okay, and then, and then the bad will get worse, and the worse will get evil, and the world will become evil, and the whole world will, will fall apart. But that's not what Jesus says. I know it looks counterintuitive. I know it looks like he doesn't have a bucket, but Jesus says, if you love, they all heal. But, but, but what if these people, what if these people come against the church, right? What if they come against the church and they try to st- shut down what we're doing, right? What if they try to shut down this event? What if they try to shut down what Jesus is doing? Then what are we going to do? Then we're going to probably take up our swords and we're going to fight them, right? It's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, if you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. Jesus said, blessed are you who are persecuted for doing righteousness. You see, Jesus is, he's looking at a group of people who are thirsty for righteousness, thirsty for justice, thirsty for the world to look like it should. And Jesus says, I could tell you how to get there. But then people say, I don't like that way. And what was true centuries ago is still true to this day. When I scroll through TikTok and I go through social medias and YouTube and I see people crying out for justice, I see people crying out for unity, I see people crying out for safety for people of all people, I see people crying out for dignity. It's interesting, not just Christians, I see non-Christians, I see atheists, I see people on these apps who would even profess themselves to be other religions and they say, but we want unity, we want love, we want humanity to be together, we want utopia. That's what people want. Isn't it interesting that that desire is not uniquely Christian? Human beings were born to have a thirst for righteousness, a thirst for justice. The problem is many people think the way to get that is by forcing them to do it. And what Jesus is going to say is, no, the way to get that is to focus on you. The way to get that is to be honest with who you are. And that's the game changer. That is the game changer. To realize that that, that you're thirsting for unity, you're thirsting for righteousness, you're thirsting for these things. But the way to get it is not to tell people and yell at people, you're not being kind and you're not being loving and you're not being unified. That's not going to get it done. What's going to have to get it done is you have to be honest with who you are. And that's the lesson this, this woman learns. She says, you don't even have a bucket. Your way's not going to work. There's no way. And then Jesus says this in verse 13. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. If you drink just normal water, if you're, if you're yelling at people, you do this, you do this, it's, it's, you're never going to stop. Because there's always going to be new sinners who are always going to do sinful things. And, and you're always going to be mad at someone. There's always going to be an enemy that you're going to feel like you're trying to vanquish. He says, you're always going to be thirsty again. The only way this happens is this, verse 14. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The water Jesus gives, that is what we're thirsty for. 
But here's the danger. When you're thirsty and someone hands you a cup, you might just be tempted to take a drink regardless of what's in it. Even if it's not what you were thirsty for. And church, that's what we have to see. That's what we have to be wise about. Let me ask you this. What are you thirsty for? Like, what are you actually thirsty for? What are you looking forward to do? What are the types of things that that you want in your life? And what's interesting is oftentimes what we want and what we drink are two different things. A lot of times we come to events like this and and we start talking about our sins. We start talking about we're going to confess our sins. We're talking about these type of things. Here's what I want you to do. If you have a pen with you, you can write on this cup. Later on, you can write on it if you want. And I want you to be honest with yourself. What are some of the things that you're tempted to be thirsty for? What are some of the things that you drink? And this is, this is just for you personally right now to be honest with. Sometimes people need a list to help them out. I'll give you a list here. We can see it on the screen um, in Galatians chapter 5. In Galatians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul is going to talk about the flesh. When the flesh is thirsty, when the flesh wants what it wants, oftentimes the flesh will drink these types of things. So let me read this list to you. These are some of the things that maybe some of you are filling your cup with. Look what it says in verse 19. Galatians 5 verse 19 picks it up. It says this, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Look at this list, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions and factions, and envy and drunkenness and orgies and the like. These are the things that so many people are drinking. But you know what's interesting? These aren't the things people are thirsty for. These are the things that people are drinking, but it's not the things that people are thirsty for. Can we put that list back up there? Galatians 5, book at verse 19. Because I just want to walk through this with you. Because some of you might be tempted to put some of these things on your cup. That you, you've been thirsty for sexual morality, you've been thirsty for impurity. You might be tempted to put some of those on the cup, but don't, don't lose track of this. Satan is a liar, and he'll often lie to you. Look what these things spell out. Like, when you're thirsty for sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, when you're drinking that, you know what you're really thirsty for? Love. You're thirsty for love. You're thirsty to be known. You're thirsty for an intimate connection, a genuine, deep connection with another human being. And you want it so bad. But you don't want to wait till the appropriate time so you're just gobbling down debauchery, pornography, impurity. When what you're thirsty for is genuine love. Let me tell you this, if intimacy is what you want, you will not get it by giving yourself away to every single person who comes along. That will only cheapen who you are. If you want intimacy, then you have to hold that intimate to one person. Look at some of these other ones. That, that, that you would have uh, witchcraft and idolatry. You know what people who are thirsty for witchcraft want? They want control. I mean, think about that. That's what, that's what witchcraft is. It's this idea that I can do potions and spells. And, and see, people are like, oh, there's not all bad. There's good witches too. I'm like, okay, Glinda. But like, there's some people who are just like, who dabble in witchcraft. But really, what do they want? They want control because they feel like their life is out of control. They feel like it's unstable. Look at this, dissensions and factions. You know what the word factions is? The word factions in military term, it actually means like, 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 a, like a platoon, like a group of people. And I see society doing this. 
I see society putting themselves into factions, putting themselves into groups, putting themselves into clusters of people who think alike and vote alike and look alike. And people are factioning themselves out because what they're thirsty for is unity. They're thirsty for unity, but they're gobbling down the wrong thing. Hatred. I don't know what exactly it is you're thirsty for, but I would bet it's good. I just think maybe the way we're going about quenching that thirst is the wrong way. When you go back to that John chapter four, that's kind of how Jesus interacts with this woman. He tells her, he said to the woman, sir, the woman said to him, she says, sir, give me this water. That's what she wants. She, she wants this true water. She wants the love. She wants the unity. She wants the compassion. She wants the true water. And then he told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Here's the beauty of that statement. A lot of times people read that and they say, look how horrible she was. She was divorced five times. Is that what, the, is that, what that verse said? Did it say she was divorced five times? Or did it say she had five husbands? We don't know her story. We don't know if those divorces happened or not. Maybe she was a widow five times over. And she's been so broken because people that she has loved have died again and again and again. And she doesn't even want to be around humanity anymore. So she goes to the well at noon because she doesn't want anyone to even talk to her or see her because she's so broken. Maybe she was divorced. We don't know. But maybe it wasn't her fault. Maybe she was used and abused and kicked to the side five times over and all she wanted was to be protected. All she wanted was to be safe. And so now she only goes outside in the middle of the day when she knows it's safe because the light is so bright. What I love about that moment is that Jesus doesn't condemn her. And what Jesus is saying about her is not just you're a sinner. What Jesus is saying is I know you. I know you. I know what you're thirsty for. And I know what you're filling your cup with. And it's not going to satisfy. It's not going to fulfill you. You're going to spend your whole life in more relationships, in more money, in more power, in more e ego, in more everything. You're going to spend your whole life filling this up, trying to get what you're thirsty for. And Jesus is saying, what you are thirsty for is what God imprinted your heart to long for. You're thirsty for me. Church, when you go on TikTok or social media, it looks like the world is out of control. But what I see is a bunch of people who are hungry and who thirst for righteousness. And in Matthew chapter five, our Lord Jesus Christ says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will find it. And that's our role in this whole thing is for you and I to leave the places like this, to go out into the world, to be kingdom workers, to help people find living water. But you cannot help people find what you have not experienced. So let's stop filling our cup with the substitute. And let's drink deep of the real thing. Jesus, his words, 
his way, his love for all races, his love for all gender, his love for all people, his love for all sinners, our Jesus who's for all. And before we can say that to anyone else with any kind of integrity, we have to say, know that that's true for us. Very end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, this is what it says. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. And let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life. It is only day two. We are gonna have so many opportunities for you to grow, so many opportunities for you to drink deep the words and the ways of Jesus this week. But the only way it's gonna get to be effective for you is first, you gotta empty your cup of the substitute. Know what it is you're thirsty for and know where it is to find it. And let's drink deep so that we can be refreshing to the world. Would you pray with me? Father God, I come before you, and Lord, that is my prayer. My prayer, God, is for each and every soul in this room. That God, you know what they are longing for. God, you know what they are thirsty for. God, you know what they are tempted to settle for. That in the anguish of their thirst for love and unity, God, many of us have sinned and fallen short of your glory. So Father, I pray, Holy Spirit, right now, would you rain down on us? Would you rain down true love? Would you rain down true unity? Would you rain down true harmony? Would you rain down, God, your kingdom? May your kingdom come and your will be done in our hearts, first and foremost. May we not force it on anyone else. May we not project it on anyone else. God, may we drink deep of it ourselves, that out of the overflow of who we are, we could show it with dignity, with respect. We could show you are the way, that which quenches our souls. Do your work in us now, Holy Spirit. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.